Hey, fourth and fifth graders. I'm so glad for those of you who are coming back for another week of reading aloud the book Sweep by Jonathan Auxier. I hope that you have been enjoying the book so far. I really like this book. Um, if you don't remember since we haven't read over the weekend, uh, when we last left off, uh, Nan had been in this bad position of the fact that she needed to escape from crud because uh, they were coming after her. So she ran out and she had to find a place to live. So she has gone to live in an old abandoned mansion that they call the house of a thousand or a th house of a hundred chimneys. So she's staying now in the house of a hundred chimneys with her little uh, char, which turns out is alive. And its name is, he's decided its name is Charlie. So Charlie has started to grow. It's It seems to eat like burned sticks and bricks and things. And it sleeps in fireplaces. And every night it kind of sucks up more soot and it gets a little bit bigger. So it has just learned to talk. And I'm actually going to back up like half a page from where we last off left off on Friday because we ended kind of abruptly. And since we had the weekend to forget. So I'm going to back up half a page and then we'll keep reading. So. By the end of the month, the captain's house was properly turned out and they set to reorganizing. We need to make this place our very own, she explained. The house was so big that they could make a room for everything. They had a tantrum room filled with cushions and pillows, a dress up room full of, full of ca uh, capes, hats and regalia, a banging pots and pans room, self-explanatory, an inventing room, a gauntlet, which was where Nan made mazes for Charlie to roll through and a rubbish room, which they had to stop using because the smell of all the food scraps became so bad. Nan named all of the rooms except for one. Charlie had requested that he do that one room all by himself. Do not peek in it, he said to her. I want the room to be a surprise. Nan had said that he could use the attic, which was an enormous and enormous and was crammed full of all sorts of unused furniture that she was far too lazy to sort. Charlie spent several days working on his room. Nan would hear an occasional crashing sound as pieces of furniture tumbled down the staircase. She had no idea how a creature without arms and legs could move furniture. Perhaps Charlie was stronger than she realized? At last, he came to her with an announcement. I have finished with my room, he said. Nan followed him to the attic. The climb was difficult on account of the stairway being full of broken furniture. She opened the door and stepped inside and looked around. What do you think? Charlie asked. I... Nan did not know what to say. It's enormous. I will call it the nothing room, he said, because it's full of nothing. That was true. Every piece of furniture and every trunk and every crate and every cobweb was gone. All that remained was a grove of chimney stacks stretching from floor to ceiling like brick tree trunks. Nan nodded. That is a good name. She hesitated. Um, what is it for? Charlie took a deep breath. For being quiet and things like that. Nan sat down next to him. A nothing room is just what this house needed. Charlie got so warm his head smoldered. He was that proud. Nan and Charlie stayed in the room all through the afternoon and into the night. Just being quiet and things like that. The late autumn sky was a cauldron of swirling gray. There was a smell of ash and mischief in the air. Dead leaves danced across the streets like brittle phantoms. And everywhere Nan went, she heard the whispering words, Remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. What did you say? Charlie asked, rolling closer. Nan must have muttered the song under her breath. Oh, it's an old rhyme to remember bonfire night, she said. That's the name of a holiday. A holy day? Charlie asked. Holidays are special times when folks dance and sing and play games and eat big meals. Oh, yes, Charlie said. We do a lot of holidays. Nan pulled on her coat and grabbed the torn bed curtain that she had been using as a muffler. A long time ago, there was a guy named Fox, and he tried to blow up the king with gunpowder, but they caught him. And now folks celebrate every year by setting off fireworks. Charlie's eyes widened. I do like fire. I know you do, Nan tied the curtain around her neck, and fireworks are even better. 
Nan wanted to take Charlie out for bonfire night, but she needed a way to transport him. In recent weeks, he had grown too large to go climbing with her. He was nearly the size of a winter squash now and heavy. Nan led him down the hallway. I thought you could ride in this. She brought up the old pre uh, perambulator. That's like a baby carriage that she had found in a closet. It was frilly and powder blue and fell out of place in a home of a seafaring bachelor. It hinted at some mystery in the captain's life that Nan could not quite piece together. This is a pram, Nan said. Nannies use them to take babies out of doors. Charlie looked up and down at the perambulator. For babies? He pushed his head against the back wheel. It squeaked. I don't think I want to be in that. Well, I can't have you tumbling down the street by yourself. She patted the handle. You'll love it in here. Charlie scooted back. I am not a baby. Nan rolled her eyes. Well, you're certainly acting like one. Get in. It turned out that pushing the pram over the granite sets was much harder than Nan had anticipated. The nannies made it look so easy. It probably didn't help that Nan's pram had three bent wheels and that Charlie was a lot heavier than a baby. Is walking always this bumpy? Charlie said. Keep your voice down, Nan grunted, forcing one of the back wheels out of her rut. We don't want anyone noticing you. Not that folks were noticing much of anything. The street was alive with bonfire night preparations. There were apple cellars and turnip lanterns and soul cakes everywhere. A pack of children ran past Nan and Charlie. They had a sort of scarecrow on their shoulders made from rags and straw. It had a long mustache and a large nose and a barrister's wig. The scarecrow was a bonfire night tradition. Children collected donations from adults to pay for the evening celebration. Who's that man they're carrying? Charlie asked. I hope he does not fall. Well, that's Guy Fox. Uh, it's a doll. They made him to look like the man who tried to blow up the king. Tonight, they're going to set him on fire. Oh, yes, Charlie said. Like Roger set you on fire. Penny for the guy, mum, one of the boys said, holding out a, cap a cup. He must have thought that Nan was older on account of the pram. That or the fact that Nan had started taking regular baths. Nan gave the boy a penny. Ordinarily, she would have never wasted money like that, but she was feeling magnanimous. However little she had, these children had less. Nan continued down Marleybourne Street towards Portman Market. She glimpsed the top of Miss Mayhew's seminary, white smoke serenely rising from the stacks. Nan wondered about the teacher, Miss Bloom. She wondered if she would be out celebrating bonfire night too. The market was teeming with every sort of person selling every sort of thing you could imagine. Hay and onions and squashes and cut poppies and tin kettles and coffee and rags and fireworks and masks. That's what we've come for, Nan said, masks. She pulled the shade over the pram, keeping Charlie hidden from view and perused the stalls. She found a burly man selling paper masks with long mustaches. Guy masks, guy masks, two for a penny. Nan paid the man and took two masks, one for her and one for Charlie. She pushed the pram over to an old woman selling fireworks out of an open crate. Bangers, Roman candles, Catherine wheels, red sizzlers, she crowed. What's bonfire night without a little pop and shimmer? Shipped direct to you from the far east. Nan pointed to the side of a crate. But it says Dover. Well, that's east, isn't it? The woman showed a toothless smile. Don't worry where they come from, lovey. Think how little set of sparklers will bring joy to your wee baby's shining eyes. Nan dug into her pocket. She had enough money to buy one firecracker. She let go of the pram and inspected the wares. Dozens of poppers and rockets and fountains neatly resting in a bed of straw. She breathed in the flinty smell of gunpowder. Behind her, she heard shouts of the market filling the air to create a new sort of song. Oranges, sweet oranges. Oh, you touch it, you boy it. Rabbits, Hampshire rabbits, tuppence and not a farthing more. Coo, what a sweet little baby. The last voice Nan recognized. It was a firework seller, and she was talking to Charlie. Wait, Nan spun around to the woman reaching in the pram. Don't touch! Ah! The woman cut her off with a piercing shriek. She was pointing at the pram, hand shaking, eyes wide. Monster! By now, the others in the market had taken notice and were crowding around the pram. Someone prodded one of the wheels with a broom handle, and the pram fell over with a crash. Charlie rolled out onto the street, and everyone screamed. 
Hello, he said, riding himself. I am Charlie. There were now new cries as more people leaped back in fear. One man fainted right on the spot. A few others held brooms and ladles out like weapons. It's hideous! Don't touch it! Somebody fetch the police! Charlie! Nan shouted, trying to push through the crowd, and then leave him alone! A burly fishmonger grabbed her by the arm. Careful, girl! There's a monster on the loose! He thought he was protecting her. Nan fought against his grip. She caught a glimpse of Charlie in the middle of the street. He was staring at the angry faces, shifting one way and another, his eyes wide with terror. Nervous trails of smoke were wafting from his body. It's burning like brimstone. It's a demon. Someone fetch the priest. A farmer took a swipe at him with a bailing fork. Charlie rolled back, crying out in fear. Nan, he called, white smoke billowing from his head. Bits of loose straw crackled and burned beneath him. Nan, why are these people trying to hurt me? He bumped against one of the crates marked Dover and Nan caught the sweet aroma of burning wood. You're scaring him, she shouted, finally breaking free from the fishmonger's gasp or grip. She sprinted toward Charlie. Get back before he pop, pop, pop. The entire crate of fireworks went off. Red, yellow, silver, and blue sparks sprayed across the market, landing on stalls and carts. Horses reared and stampeded. Men and women staggered blindly through the sulfurous smoke, screaming for help. Nan dove behind a barrel of herrings and covered her ears from the explosions as more and more fireworks went off. At last, the explosion stopped. People were yelling and sobbing along the street. Police whistles sounded in the distance. Nan knew that she needed to get Charlie out of there before he was caught. She stifled a cough and pulled her muffler back over her mouth. The air was so thick that she could scarcely see her own feet. Charlie! Her throat burned from smoke. I'm coming! Nan crawled to what remained of the fireworks stall. By now, the smoke had dissipated, revealing a husk of charred splinters. Scorch marks ran along the garnet, uh, granite sets. Charlie! She shouted, throwing aside chunks of smoldering wreckage. But Charlie was gone. Nan searched the area around the market for any sign of Charlie. Then she checked out all of Marleybourne and Westminster. She realized that Charlie would probably have rolled downhill, so she traveled east into the streets of her old life. The sun had long set and bonfire night was in full swing. The streets were now filled with masked revelers. There was only one of two days each year that the rich and poor celebrated together. At nearly every corner, she saw crowds burning guys. Seeing the flaming effigies, she recalled her own experience in the seminary chimney. Suddenly, bonfire night didn't seem like a holiday after all. Nan passed a crowd gathered outside Mansion House, which was where the Lord Mayor lived. Men and women were shouting and waving torches, factory workers from the look of them. Labor riots like this seemed to be happening more and more in the city. Now, not that they changed anything. There was a crashing sound as someone threw a brick through one of the mansion windows. A whistle sounded and the policemen broke into the crowd with batons. Nan kept her head down and rushed along Lombard Street. She didn't want to get caught in any of the trouble. As Nan entered the East End, she put her Guy Fox mask over her head. Doubtless there were climbers about, someone who might recognize her. She checked the alleys. She checked the stoops. She checked every place she could think of. But there was no Charlie. Charlie! She called for the hundredth time. Her voice was raspy from shouting. She cursed herself. If she'd been paying more attention, if she hadn't strayed from the pram, Charlie would still be safe. She tried not to think about whether Charlie was hurt. She didn't even know if he could be hurt. She'd seen him fall from some pretty great heights without complaining, and fire didn't burn him. She eyed the river. Bonfires along the south shore of the Thames reflected off its shimmering surface. Could Charlie float? Bells across London struck 10 o'clock. She took a deep breath and tried to think like Charlie. If she were lost, where would she go? She thought of him in the morning. He was always up with the bell staring out the window that faced east. Nan had assumed that he was looking toward the sunrise, but maybe he was looking toward something else. She remembered Charlie before he was Charlie, back when he was always just a lump of soot. She thought of some mornings he managed to escape her pocket and roll out the window in Crud's Colbin, and roll to the window in Crud's Colbin, as though something were drawing him in that direction. Nan turned up her collar and walked down Whitechapel Road toward her old home. 
She knew it was foolish. Even with a mask, any number of people might rest recognize her, including Crud. The November wind had turned brutal and cold. She balled her fists in her pocket and wished that she still had the sweep's hat. She wondered what had happened to it after she escaped from the nudge. Perhaps it had burned in the fire. As she walked, she saw landmarks that she had always known. The matchstick, the Tower of London, London Hospital. They all looked smaller than she remembered. Finally, Nan caught sight of St. Florian's rising from the hill in the east. The church steeple cast a shadow over Tower Hamlets. She moved slowly, keeping in shadow. Fireworks echoed off of distant streets, lighting the sky ahead. Overhead, Nan searched along the outer gates of the church. She took off her mask and called, Charlie? She saw something moving in the darkness. Nan? A voice said. And we'll pick up there tomorrow. See you guys. Have a great day.